When Peter Minuet bought Manhattan Island, a wilderness of forest and stream, from the Indians for $24 worth of trade goods in 1626, the enterprising Dutchman struck a good bargain. For three centuries later, the investment had increased in value 400 million times, and viewed from the moon, let us say, would appear as a great fungus growth that had slowly spread and consumed the wilderness. But we're getting ahead of our story. By 1660, the thriving Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam had begun to take definite shape at the lower tip of the island. The city's requirements were few and simple. A stockade and fort as protection against hostile Indians, storehouses for food and the goods of the West India Company, houses for settlers, a landing place and a recreation center, the Bowling Green. Governor Peter Stuyvesant's great house was the most imposing structure in the settlement and stood where the Custom House now is. Today, the needs of that locality are vastly different and the city has adapted itself to the change demands. Only the Bowling Green has left its trace. By 1750, the wilderness had receded. Upper Manhattan had become almost a suburb, but it was a long journey by coach to the Blue Bell Tavern at Broadway and 181st Street. Now it is a matter of minutes for the teeming millions who daily come to the city's business centers over thousands of miles of transport arteries, above and below the earth, by land and water. New York, by 1850, had become one of the world's greatest seaports. Sailing ships from every corner of the globe brought their cargoes to the metropolis of the New World. South Street was a wilderness of spars and rigging, serving the needs of sailor and ship. Today, the shipping center has moved. Huge ocean leviathans discharge their passengers and freight on the great piers that line the North River. As we have seen, the city is a living, growing thing, continually changing and adapting itself to new conditions. Then, what of the future? Change in all probability will be even greater than in the past. Let Hugh Ferris, the artist and architect, give us his vision of the city of the future. Of course, no one can clearly foresee the city of the future. But the appearance of any city, of any period of history, is the direct outcome of the social, economic, and technological conditions then existing. Take, for example, the city of today. A vast conglomeration of skyscrapers and slums. Owners building whatever tenement or tower they please on their own plots. Here is the architectural record of an economic order of laissez-faire and rugged individualism. If we are to abandon this for some new order based on broad-scale, long-term planning, it also will produce an architecture all its own. Cities of the future would be laid out according to master plans. Their streets and buildings no longer haphazard, but harmoniously related. The skyscraper, in itself a useful form, would still appear, but only at isolated, predetermined points in the city plan. Structural ingenuity would, of course, go on producing unusual forms, perhaps suspension bridge apartment houses. These would surely provide wide vistas for the bridge dwellers, and perhaps gratify the very human desire for novelty and romance. But city planning would be quite realistic as to our future streets. They must be broad avenues, providing speed and ease of movement with light and pure air for abutting buildings. Perhaps the master stroke of planning would be to segregate on one hand coordinated automatic industrial centers, producing all needed goods and distributing them in abundance, while far removed and entirely outside the atmosphere of the machine would rise new centers of leisure around which we would live, fully participating in the sports, the arts, the sciences, in all the activities which make life worth living. Those celestial astronomers, should there be any, may glimpse in our future cities an environment fully encouraging to human values an environment already made feasible by modern science and awaiting only a modernized economics. In bus, flivver, or proud Rolls Royce, you may follow the seahorse to Jones Beach State Park, 
New York's amazing 3,000-acre seaside playground. Parking space is provided for 23,000 cars. A mile-long boardwalk with cafeterias, dining rooms, and tea terraces for every purse. Cleanliness is the watchword. Fringed by the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the quiet bay waters on the other, the beach is an ideal refuge from the heat and noise of the nearby city. The property of the state for the people's free enjoyment. A sunlit salt water pool is free to less venturesome bathers. Also a special one for children, where free swimming instruction is given. 1,200 were taught to swim here in 1934. If you go in for this sort of thing, here it is. Every afternoon at three. Completely free of the noisy midway amusements found in most seaside parks, healthful out-of-door games are provided for children and grown-ups alike, many of them free. Playgrounds under competent supervisors and a sand pile five miles long make it a veritable paradise for children of all ages. Zach's Bay is ideal for small boat and canoe racing. If you tire of crowds and organized amusement, just wander up the beach which stretches straight and unspoiled for 17 miles. Sun, air, and sea, free to everyone who will take the trouble to seek them a social achievement of tremendous importance. Here is democracy at its best, a milestone on the path our forefathers chose, a reality which gives a glimpse of the golden promise and boundless hope of our America of tomorrow. <laughs>